you can't be a good journalist unless you have a kind of uh, baseline respect for what others can teach you. Would you encourage younger people to go and get into those big cities if they're if they're trying to have careers in things like journalism? Don't fall in the trap of doing when you're 23 of doing the comfortable thing and staying near family and friends. That's there'll be plenty of time for that later. What about your father? What was he like? He said you were very, very competitive. I read that somewhere. Yeah, he, I think he thought, I think he was competitive. I don't know whether, I think, I was quite competitive, but in a kind of, at games hmm. and at running. Um, my father was uh, a very, very Englishman. He was from Kent. He was, uh, he liked dogs and gardening <laughs> and long walks in the rain. Uh, he was uh, exceedingly intelligent um, but it combined with a kind of humility that was, and I realized that as I get older, it's the humility that was the more important um, aspect of his uh, personality. So he would never, he was probably smarter than most people he met, but he would never, ever make that explicit. And he was, if he thought that you even had a slight edge of knowledge in some domain over him, he would defer to you which made him an incredibly curious, he was curious about everything and would ask. He had friendships with people who had dropped out of school at the age of 10. I mean, he was, and he was a man with a PhD in, you know, in mathematics. Um, so he was a wonderful, he was, he was a really wonderful role model for a, uh, for a little boy. Well, how did you and what, what, why and how did you learn the value of that humility? and the impact and the importance of it when you're dealing with other people? Well, I think it's because you can't be a good journalist unless you have a kind of uh, baseline respect for what others can teach you. If you're going to interview, be a good interviewer, you must enter into every interview with the expectation that you know less, that the person you're interviewing has some, something to tell you. Right. And that's actually much more difficult than it sounds, because nor in normal conversation, we have an urge to assert ourselves. And we think we have a kind of um, intellectual advantage, informational advantage. That's why we you watch people talk. Interruptions are all about often about the other person asserting their superiority on that point. Someone says, oh, it'll take me forever to get here. The other person says, no, it won't. Right. You can't be a journalist if you, you have to turn that off if you want to be an effective interviewer. It's got me reflecting on various people. One of the people that made me reflect on it interestingly was Joe Rogan, how he he's feels like such a bridge to his audience and listeners but because he does come across as being tremendously humble regardless of who he's, who he's speaking to. He always seems to understate his intelligence as well. He always calls himself a monkey. Yes. Especially yes. When he's, you know. He has a kind of... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he... Yes, he, well, he has this wonderful thing... Um, where he can put himself, he's squarely in the position of his listeners, mm. which is really, you know, for a for a host of of, a, of any kind of show like that is, if you can do that, you're gonna win. You're gonna win, right? He there's there's he's he's having the conversation that his listeners wish they could be having with with the subjects in his in his uh, on his show. On that point of journalism, at what point in your your early years, did you, was there any inclination that you might become a journalist? You might go into that profession, if any. Never in the, I mean, I had thought about, I liked writing. I didn't imagine that it was a profession. It didn't occur to me that you could actually make a living doing it. So I always was thinking of other things I wanted to do. And then I kind of fell into it by accident after my, after I, I graduated from uh, university. So I, I never really, I just, I thought of something you did on the side, you know, I, I didn't, it seemed unimaginable that somebody would pay you to do this kind of work. The lack of role models, the lack of examples. No, no I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a little bit of it. If I had grown up in, you know, New York or Toronto or London, I would have been much more aware of people who, 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 you know, were in the creative professions, but I grew up in a town of 4,000 people, there were no one, there was no one in my town who made a living in the creative 
professions, right? You, you wouldn't live in a small town like that and do that. So I didn't know. I have friends who grew up in, you know, Manhattan and they, they knew, they knew film, film, filmmakers and actors and, you know, fiction writers and as, as part of their parents' circle when they're growing up. I knew none of that. What advice would you give to, to people around that age? Say that, you know, early 20s, just maybe just graduated and thinking about going off into the world. Because I hear a lot of these these stories about certain small factors can have such a tremendous impact on your outcomes, like the city you live in. Would you encourage your younger people to go and get into those big cities if they're if they're trying to have careers in things like journalism or media or whatever or, or business? And how much of a how much of a swing does that have? Because I always think, you know, I'm on Dragon's Den and I see these entrepreneurs coming in and pitching tech companies. And I always think, oh, sometimes I think you're at like a, a 90% disadvantage versus just being over there on the West Coast of America mm -hmm. in San Francisco. Um, I, I think sometimes I think it's more than a 90% disadvantage, but situational yeah. and environmental factors on outcomes. It's always been this puzzle in many countries, but particularly the United States, about why do immigrants do so well? And... Uh, you know, the, one of the explanations was immigrants to the United States have always been very aggressive about seeking educational opportunities, or maybe they brought with them education. That, so that was one argument for the longest time. But now we realize actually it's less that and more that they, are, unlike many, many Native Americans, are willing to move where opportunities are. So the, the, the immigrants are mobile in a way. They don't have any roots they don't have family that's keeping them in one place or another. They simply make a beeline for the places where they can, you know, further their own economic and personal interests the quickest and the most efficiently. Native Native people don't do that because they have too many encumbrances. And I so my advice to people, young people, is always, where do you want to move? It's the first question you should ask yourself. Your your default should be, you're going to move somewhere, right? Don't fall in the trap of doing when you're 23 of doing the comfortable thing and staying near family and friends. That's there'll be plenty of time for that later. The only question on your mind should be where should I move? And once you decide where you move, I think a lot of other things fall into place. So if you are someone who imagines that you would like to start a company in the tech world, and then yeah, move to, move to Northern California or Austin, Texas or Tel Aviv or whatever, you know. Go where the, I think you're absolutely right. You need to go where the opportunity is. It's not going to come to you magically. And you are at a huge disadvantage if you're not there. It's, it's, it's just no question about that. People have confused the efficiency of digital communication, the kind of um, uh, the logistical efficiency of digital communication with emotional efficiency and kind of psychological efficiency. It is, it is only logistically Efficient. It does not resolve the question. It doesn't help someone trust you more or take a chance on you or get to know you in all of your complexity. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor. Become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously. And the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.